Okay. So I want to welcome uh, Joe Giordano from Red Hat. He's going to tell us a little bit about some of their solutions for leveraging hybrid cloud. And uh, Joe, take it away. Sure, great. Thank you very much. And I'm going to share my screen. And just let me know if you can see that okay. Yes. Okay. Make a full screen for you guys. All right, great. So, well, thank you for being here. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody. Um, I'm really excited. This is my first participation with the, the ListNet group, and I hope it's uh, you know one of many, many to come. And I look forward to meeting everybody when we're able to actually congregate in person again. Um, my name is Georgia Dano. Um, I'm the chief architect for the Northeast Regional, Regional Office of Technology for Red Hat. Um, I've been working in IT for over 23 years. Uh, local companies, Cablevision, CA, uh, Symantec when it was on Long Island, uh, and a few others. Um, I've spent seven years at Red Hat now uh, focusing on uh, previously to my current role of chief architect, I was a solutions engineer uh, in the FSI space, focusing on some of the largest banks uh, in the country, uh, worldwide actually. So um, I have a lot of experience there. Um, personally, I have three daughters who are adjusting to being home all the time and not socializing and cancellation of sports. Uh, 15 years old, 11 years old, and I have a 20 month old. Um, I'm active, you know, I try to stay active and I really attribute a lot of the way I um, focus on technology to, you know, uh, my my fitness ex experiences and my um, lifting and training and things like that. So um, I kind of look at it in, this, in a, a little bit of a different lens than most people. So what we're gonna talk about today, um, and we're gonna establish some goals, right? We're gonna answer some questions around, you know, what we could do together, being open. Um, open is big at Red Hat, and I wanna explore what open and open source means and how it relates to open innovation and how we actually cultivate those products for Red Hat. Uh, understand how to take advantage of open hybrid cloud and some of our solutions along with that. And lastly, define open culture. And this is a big one because it's really critical to the success of number one and number two, participating in open source and taking advantage of the open hybrid cloud. So we're gonna start at the beginning. We're gonna have a little bit of con context around um, participating in open source and open source. Um, some of it may be things that you guys know already. Um, it's basically, uh, we're gonna start with the framework of what open source is and build into how it attributes and how it relates to open hybrid cloud and a lot of the other solutions. So let's begin with a quote from Stephen O'Grady. Um, the argument is that software is central to every business today, not just software companies, and software strategic role in any business is changing. You know, we've heard the stories of Uber, transportation company without a fleet, Airbnb, uh, hospitality company without property. Software is the ability to innovate and it's critical to the health and competitiveness and growth of any business. Um, market leaders need to be cognizant of that because their positions could change overnight. So organizations are recognizing this and you know, your decision when you look at you know, technology is you're not just selecting a software stack anymore, you're actually choosing an innovation model because of the, the way and the speed at which everything's changing. Software is central to how all of your organizations are doing business. And by making technology decisions, you're not just picking a tool, or tools, set of tools. You're making a statement about how you'll operate, how you'll produce value, how you engage with your customers, how you meet challenges from competitors, and you know, you're embedding that statement in your set of tools. So we're gonna talk about innovation and really two definitions of innovation, creating value and reducing what firms pay for services. So enterprises are definitely cognizant that open source is really, you know, leading the way from an innovation perspective. And, you know, the tools and technology that they need to derive are coming from open source. Enterprise open source technologies are helping drive that adoption. These statistics are from our first ever state of the enterprise open source report. They show that IT leaders believe enterprise open source, like the products Red Hat provides, are critical to the success of their organizations. And they also note that enterprise open source is growing significantly. Uh, one acknowledgement that I want to make sure we're aware of, and we'll come back to this a little bit later, is 
what's the difference between enterprise open source and community open source? And I'll share these slides after the presentation as well, so you can have them for reference. So let's start with an easy example, right? It's called sharing the recipe and it's part of a larger um, presentation and workshop around how to help customers um, engage and participate in open source. So here's an example. Let's say you're a baker and you're selling cookies. Um, you're so good, in fact, people tell you you should sell your cookies. So you, there's two ways of going about this. The traditional way of baking a cookie, packaging them up, selling them, having your customers consume them and coming back to buy them. There's a second way, and there's the innovative way. You bake the cookies, you package them up, and then you actually print out the recipe step-by-step -step and best practices on how to bake those particular cookies, and you slap it on the box. And you sell those cookies. And the second option, you enabled anyone to make the cookies for themselves. You're gonna have people that still come to you and buy them for convenience or for the experience that you provide. But what you've done is you've empowered your customers to be able to improve on what you've already established. You've invited others to collaborate with you. You've catalyzed communities of bakers to share and participate in that recipe. You've opened it up to new innovations that come from outside, new ideas that you may not have thought of or you didn't have the skill sets to, to you know, enable. And you've also made the cookies more secure. Now everybody can see what's in the recipe and be alerted to harmful ingredients like allergens or something. The second way is the open source way. Let's get a bit more technical. There are certain aspects of open source that are critical and foundational to open source development. And these come from the free software de definition which the Free Software Foundation maintains. The freedom to run programs as you wish for any purpose. You have the freedom to study how the program works, change it so it does the computing in the way that you wish. Access to the source code is a precondition for this to happen. You, can, you have the freedom to redistribute copies so that you can help others. And you have the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others, giving the community a chance to share and benefit from your changes. Again, the source code to this is a precondition as well. And there's different licensing models that apply to open source technologies that are well beyond the scope of this talk today, but are part of the larger talk around open source specifically. So one, let's clarify something. Open source is not a business model. Red Hat's business model isn't selling software. It's providing support, which consists of technical, functional, and legal guarantees as well as selling services to enable the most efficient and optimized use of open source software. Some people think that just by opening up their you know, software bits, they're gonna automatically create new revenue streams or generate you know, new income. You know, and they, they don't really have a profit model, they just throw an open source project out there. Open source isn't really a business model as much as it is a development methodology. So let's go back to the, the recipe example. You know, if you're already contributing to open source, this just makes sense to you by nature. But the opportunity to share with the wider distribution goes beyond the end product. You know, you'll be able to get recipe improvements that you can take in, you're relying on the expertise of a wider pool. So let's summarize some of the benefits. You improve the recipe, you make cookies better. You're leveraging the collective wisdom of the bakers globally. It may change some of the ingredients. They may change, may like the way it tastes better. Um, you may reduce the number of calories. Think of this as improving the speed and performance of the application that's out there. You might identify recipe variations in niche markets that you can explore, things like gluten-free or um, specific, you know, uh, tweaks around the recipe for a, a specific uh, market itself. In the software industry, these are things like scientific computing that make its way into spins and forks of certain pieces of software. You build a committed community of bakers who advocate and popularize your particular recipe. They may have specific environments that they're, they're building. and Maybe the water is very specific where they are and it changes the way um, the cookies come out and they share that. Now you're, you're documenting that. It's kind of like um, a best practices or pooling documentation and, and resources for these folks. You discover the most talented innovative bakers and this is big. You can hire them at your bake, bake shop growing the pool of established 
you know, uh, employees that you have to pull from. And you position yourself as a leading specialist and a thought leader in this cookie recipe space. So translating that into a, a real technical aspect, attracting and retaining better talent, all of the innovative technologies today have a foundation in open source. Think AI ML, Kubernetes, Linux, the newer JavaScript frameworks. By actively participating in open source, you are broadcasting that your company is in an innovative place for developers to be and work. And you're meeting with them where they participate. Students have access to the open source technologies a lot more than they have to legacy technologies that you know were software licensing and maintenance were needed to acquire. Employers can interact with those hires in the community that they, they're participating in and see how that person interacts on the job. This is much more effective than your traditional interview process and it leads to better hiring and increased retention. And it's a very big factor in how Red Hat does its hiring. You're able to influence the direction of technology, technological development. So one of the big reasons to participate in open source is to see the roadmap and see where technology is going and be on the cutting and bleeding edge. Even if you just you know, participate in the communities and listen, it gives you the ability to plan in your own environment, your own companies and, and IT departments. If you start to contribute, now you have the option to actually present and drive the future vision of a project for discussion. The key to participating though is not just driving it for your specific need, but the benefits of more than your need, right? So uh, participating in an open source community, if you're constantly contributing uh, very, something very specific to your company that doesn't necessarily benefit the overall community, um, that could be a challenging way to contribute. Increased code quality. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit about security in, in a few minutes, but you know, essentially increased code quality allows more people to see, look at your code vet, and ultimately contribute better code to the project. Multiple developers bringing different skills and, and perspectives are able to spot issues, security vulnerabilities, and other problems more quickly. A lot of people refer to this in the Linux community as Linus's law, obviously named after Linus Torvalds, you know, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. So how does this really relate to Red Hat and Red Hat's portfolio of what we offer our customers? So looking at the larger, you know, uh, open source ecosystem, there's what's called an upstream and a downstream. The source for an open source project is, de is, is generally referred to as the upstream of the projects. And most of the projects that are built downstream are what get productized. Innovations occur in the upstream on the, on the left side of the screen in individual projects. And then they benefit a lot of the downstream projects where it's a little bit more stable and um, usable for, for most customers. Now, if changes are needed in the downstream projects, the proper and correct way to do it is to take those changes and propose them back into the upstream so that they make their way back downstream for everybody. As you can see, Linux on the left-hand side is just one component of a bunch of components that really don't do much together, right? So let's, you know, let's look at that. Linux itself, the kernel, needs a whole bunch of other things for it to be usable to, you know, people, you know, all over the world. So they get combined into a whole, and this actual open source community project, Fedora, which Red Hat is a sponsor of, brings all those components together into an actual coherent platform in a desktop and server environment. Fedora is the community, community maintained project that has structure and it has you know, maintainers, committers, leaders, um, in all aspects of documentation and testing. Um, and that's where you know, the experimentation happens in putting this stuff all together. So the innovations that occur in Fedora have a chance, and I'll put air quotes around chance, of flowing downstream into RHEL, into Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So what's upstream for one project might not be downstream for others or may be downstream for multiple projects. Red Hat looks at Fedora and the state of Fedora 
and chooses what components have become mature enough, stable enough, and supportable enough to include in RHEL. RHEL then gets certified, tested, in conjunction with a whole bunch of hardware and software platforms to ensure that it's stable for you to run in your data centers. Then, of course, groups are regularly you know, proposing fixes to us, requests for enhancements, updates and patches. You know, we're finding security vulnerabilities. Those have to make its way back upstream. So the projects on which are relying, they continuously improve by taking those fixes and putting them upstream. A key point here is something I talked about earlier about the difference between enterprise open source and community open source. When we have an enterprise open source project product such as RHEL, we fix and patch and update that. We take that patch and we push it back upstream so it makes its way downstream. That change then gets implemented going forward. Keep in mind going forward. Enterprise open source will make that available for all the platforms in its current life cycle. Now, if you are just using community-based open source and you have that deployed across your entire data center, that security patch does not get backported. So it only gets put into the versions going forward. So you would have to move forward and roll forward on every release of that particular project that you have deployed. So that's where the, the, the benefit of community, or the benefit of enterprise versus community sits. So one of the benefits. So let's talk a little bit about how Red Hat, you know, Red Hat participates. We've been doing this development methodology for, for over 25 years, fostering upstream projects that get pulled into actual communities themselves and then get secured and stabilized, make, we make them consumable for the stock exchanges, the airlines, life-saving medical systems, nuclear submarines, you name it, you know, RHEL, is, RHEL and the, some of the products on top of it, you know, fit into the space as the, you know, de facto enterprise Linux standard. So where am I going with this and how does that relate to you? Well, the open source community has the ability to develop, to develop and, and move at a pace that most software companies could not do or can't do anymore. Uh, we have access to you know, a larger, broad, broader spectrum of developers, like I mentioned, and we're able to innovate faster. Most traditional software companies, whether they go the full model like Red Hat, which is very rare, Red Hat's one of the few companies that does this, um, and has a fully open source model where every single product that we have subscriptions for is open source, or they have an open core, which is most of the, the software that they deliver to customers is open source, but they have some proprietary components, or at the very least, just about every software company is participating in open source in some capacity today. All of the infrastructure and cloud, um, the, you know, if you're using IoT devices and edge devices, all of those have some core of open source technology in utilize, utilized today. So what are the challenges that Red Hat's trying to address for their customers? Well, a lot of traditional companies were trying to reduce the threat for start, from startups that are able to take advantage of the open source technology and don't have a lot of technical debt, or just maintain market position against competitors. Modernize, you know, the, the solutions that they've had in place for, you know, 20 and 30 years. Really try to generate new revenue and get value out of those, you know, uh, traditional systems. Build and release new products more rapidly, right? Everybody's affected by you know, the Apple store of the world and, and the Android Play store of, you know, new updates getting released on a daily basis, new features, new capabilities. We want to transition from hardware to software and, and take advantage of the ability to scale through software. You know, we want to automate the processes and make software and the services we deliver more reliable and more secure, as well as reduce the overall risk for everybody. A lot of our customers today are really just responding to, you know, COVID and COVID-19 challenges, how they're going to, you know, do business in the future, how business is going to change, remote working, and, you know, a whole host of other things that were not even, you know, being planned for six to eight months ago. So, basically, how do you promote 
innovation and exceed ever increasing customer expectations. There's no way you can put all your money, your people and time into new technologies and still run a business, right? That's why there's companies like ours that help you do this. There was already a severe skills gap before COVID-19 with regard to Kubernetes, containers, microservices. Um, so it was very difficult for com companies to take advantage of these. And I've seen it firsthand where, you know, my customers were losing people every six months where they jump around to different companies. And, and a lot of the technical knowledge is lost on that. And this is why mode one and mode two both exist. And the world is hybrid, right? And the world is increasingly hybrid. Here's what we're hearing and seeing from you know, our customers and your, some of your peers. And these are the top challenges, right? Optimizing the IT you have because you don't want to throw that investment away. You want to get value out of it. And how can we get a value out of it? Integrating those old systems, right? Trying to add new systems that interface with that, um, utilize those resources and some of those best practices that you've developed. Modernize those. The big one for today is going to be delivering cloud infrastructure and cloud services, building monitoring applications and solutions, reducing risk and increasing efficiency with automation and efficient and making things more efficient and secure. So what are the requirements of an open hybrid cloud? We've done this with a number of different customers. We've helped them build self-service portals that enable customers, developers, business analysts, um, you name it, to go in, request the service that they want to provision and have rules around those services that they don't see. Uh, this is generally a fully automated system um, that interfaces with you know, the, 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 the key CMDBs, budgeting systems, and tech, you know, technology infrastructure that allow them to you know, get approvals and, and, the, and see the constraints where the workloads are gonna be deployed. Again, this is to enable the developers, the business analysts, the application deployers to move at a pace that's not inhibited by IT. And there's technology around there that, you know, things like Ansible and Terraform that allow customers to do this today. That gets deployed in a VM or a container somewhere, whether it's an open stack on a private cloud somewhere in infrastructure, traditional VM or in a public cloud or on OpenShift, our flagship container product. This gets deployed, but the key here is there's no restriction on where that workload needs to be put. There can be rules around it being put in a specific area for scale purposes or efficiency purposes, but ultimately, the real key to hybrid cloud is that workload can be deployed anywhere. It has to be automated, and, so, and, and it has to be deployed in a way that doesn't require approvals or configurations at a manual level. And there's a lot of technology that Red Hat has that offers capabilities to do this, right? We have lifecycle automation management, we have automation tools, um, but ultimately, you know, there should be no user input at this point, you know, and it should be deployed, configured in a reasonable amount of time that, you know, the user can take advantage of it and not go somewhere else for that same service. And then we're going to proactively monitor and identify issues going forward. And we, we need to figure out ways of not monitoring in the traditional sense of something goes wrong, someone gets paged, and something gets fixed, monitoring and reacting in a way where we actually see service degradation before there's actual failures and we address that service degradation immediately whether that's bringing up a new container uh, rolling back an automated fix that's been you know deployed but all of that happens with very little user input and automating that and automating it you know back to the beginning and, and this whole process is a continuous loop where improvements are made um, in the automation layer so that they're, you know, they're always, they're always improving and they're always innovating going forward. So let's talk a little bit about the, the utilizing the technology that we provide, and then we'll get into what these technologies, you know, look like. So a change for a lot of organizations is actually getting involved with open source technology and implementing them. Um, pulling mo most customers that we've seen 
are using open source technologies in some capacity. The risks are, is your developer grabbing some random project from upstream without thinking about the life cycle of that project and deploying it in production? Is security delivered forward for that project? Do you have insight into the roadmap? Do you know, does the, is, the pro, pro, is that project have such a vibrant community where it's gonna exist in five years? Or is it some, some a project that very low, contri very low contri contributors are maintaining that could potentially dry up, and now your business three years down the road is relying on something that's you know really a, a retired project? And is it sustainable? The mitigation that mitigation of that is working with open source vendors that have the expertise to make sure that security is backported, indemnification is held um, by that you know, open source company, and there's influence in the community so that your interests are looking forward. And the benefits are obviously delivering new capabilities, using that innovative technology, attracting talent, staying in innovative, all of the things that we talked about before. What about storing data in the public cloud? Right? This is a big change for a lot of organizations, and, and I think it's a real big risk that, you know, people underestimate. So, Two of the big risks are the, the residency requirements of that data, where it resides, and the vulnerability and exposure to that data. So one of the things that has been going on for uh, you know, the past couple of years is other countries outside of the US are becoming more and more cognizant of the value of the data. I think COVID-19 actually increases a lot. But countries are, are requiring that the data now be held within their borders. So that's something that's you know challenging to a lot of organizations because all of a sudden now you have to take the data that you stored in a single you know location, whether it was in public cloud, or on premise, and now you have to disperse that through you know different countries and their requirements and, and their laws. And the second part of that is the vulnerability and exposure, having this data in multiple locations. Now I have some, and again, I'm gonna send you this presentation after, but I have some interesting facts and analytics that were you know, um, provided via the Verizon data breach report that gets released every year. And what they found was that, you know, there's, there's a whole host of, of ways that customers are being attacked and hacked and, and you know, exploited but they're all, they all fluctuate going up or down depending on their technology. But the one critical thing that I took away from the report is that errors are actually increasing at a substantial rate, right? And specifically misconfigurations. So now think about working with three different cloud providers, multiple technologies and infrastructure on premise, and all of the things that your teams need to all the knowledge that they need to have to configure that stuff. And basically what we end up with is people are deploying things faster. They're not specialized in the technology they're deploying on. So they don't understand the ramifications and they're not securing their data. So this is a really big problem that, you know, uh, exploits and exposes people to a lot of risk in the cloud. So how do you avoid this? Well, you avoid locking by using some something like open source storage, right? You know, Red Hat has Red Hat Ceph, which is the backend for a lot of our cloud products, specifically OpenStack and OpenShift. And what using software defined and open source storage allows you to do is it allows you to abstract away from the single cloud provider, right? So you're not locked into their particular storage you're standing across, standardizing across multiple cloud providers, you're able to automate and, and, and make sure that your configurations are enforced and you're basically normalizing the, the technology, the skill set, and the configuration amongst different you know, underlying infrastructures. You're in control of your data. It also allows you to move your data at your disposal without you know, the, incurring the costs and the you know the challenges of being all in in a particular cloud provider because let's be honest 
I've seen this, you know, and I think this is a this is a great story. You, you can find, you know, multiple times on the on the net. Company decides to start utilizing the public cloud, and all of a sudden, before they know it, they're getting, you know, they're most of their storage is is they didn't realize how many pet, petabytes and terabytes of data were going to be stored in Amazon, and now, you know, for them to move that out, the cost is astronomical. So what do they do at that point? So again, the risk is getting locked into a single provider. A big one I'm going to talk a little bit about is also problem as a service, right? So the cloud providers allow your customers internally and your, you know, your departments to deploy in a faster manner, right? We're no longer waiting for, you know, the service to be delivered, racked, and configured for, for utilization. But if you're using the same approval processes and you haven't changed your culture, you're basically taking your problems and deploying your problems in the cloud. I mentioned the overextending of skills, the different SLAs of cloud providers, and the unforeseen cost of being charged for microtransactions, um, you know, in a specific cloud provider for an everyday, you know, utilization. So how do you mitigate against this? Again, utilizing standard platforms like OpenShift Container Platform, automating everything, picking the correct workloads to move into the cloud, things that, you know, minimize the actual data and the analysis and the transaction there. But the key is also fixing your processes and cultures first. Um, so that's really uh, one of the things that Red Hat focuses on with customers. And again, you know, the, the abstraction of the differences along the cloud provider lines and infrastructure is very big for our customers and it gives them a lot of leverage. Now, I wanna touch on something that you may be thinking that we get asked a lot. So from a vendor lock-in perspective, some people say, well, you know, okay, so I'm not locked into a cloud provider, but if I'm using one of your products, how, you know, how am I preventing lock-in from Red Hat? Well, Red Hat is a subscription-based service. So when you utilize, let's say, RHEL, for instance, every year we ask you to renew your subscription, and that subscription gives you access to service support patches and whatnot. But ultimately, you still own the bits that you purchased at that time. Now you're not gonna, if you terminate the subscription, you're not gonna get new bits and fixes, but you own those bits. And if you terminate the relationship with Red Hat, you still have access to the services that you're deploying and the, 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 the source code. You can change it, you can fix it, you could modify it on your own if you wanted to. Um, and like you saw on the slide with all the Red Hat projects and products, all of our products are derived from upstream communities. So essentially, all of the functionalities and all of the, the source code is from those communities. So you can actually go to the community if you wanted to. And that's why Red Hat has to work really hard at the subscription and making sure that our customers are happy and we're being innovative and we're providing additional services above and beyond just the, the, the bits we ship. If you're in a cloud provider and you terminate that contract, they turn, they're going to turn off your services. So, you know, if there's a contract dispute or if they change the terms, um, you have to figure out how to move your entire infrastructure and everything to another provider or bring it back internally. And that's not something that's, you know, that you can take lightly. And we'll, most likely what will happen is there'll be a period of time that's very painful for you. So, minimizing that challenge modernizing you know applications you know the risks are you know expanded target from ha hackers again I, I talked about you know configuring things um i want to you know point out that you know one of the big again going back to the verizon data breach report uh, the server and the specifically the application server the web application server are still the primary way that customers are getting breached right so how do, how do we minimize that how do we minimize those risks right we go back to you know building in security from the start working with vendors such as ourselves again the difference between enterprise open source and upstream open source community-led we have a trusted supply chain right we basically make sure that when we compile our binaries from source 
we can track where and when they were compiled, what goes into them, um, how they're distributed, you know, the, the keys that are distributed with them. If that's a, a container, it's done in the same way. If we're offering a container for customer consumption, you know, through a partner, they have to meet certain criteria and standards to make sure that their container is updated and maintained at a certain, uh, you know, certain rate. Security is built in by default. Ironically, a lot of customers, even the most security focused ones, turn off a lot of the capabilities that Red Hat offers within their operating system, things like SE Linux, that make it much more difficult for um, hackers to, you know, to try to target. So, you know, again, in the, in the slides in the data analysis section, which I, you'll get, um, I, uh, let me point that out. Um, yeah. Basically, you want to make it as hard as possible for a hacker to get into your environment. So you want to put as many barriers up as possible. So what does that mean? That means enabling SE Linux at the host level, enabling the in-house in auditing that comes with RHEL, uh, making sure things are patched, using tools like Satellite, Red Hat Satellite, to make sure tool, things are patched, using things like Red Hat Insights, which we'll get into, uh, that does proactive monitoring and configuration monitoring. Um, utilizing, making, making it very difficult for hackers to, you know, to get into your systems and, and discouraging them if they get, do get in to say, you know what, this is, this is too much of a pain and I'm gonna expose myself. I'm skipping this and I'm gonna go somewhere else. I'm gonna find somewhere that's easier to break into. Hey, hey Joe, so, I, wanna, again, uh, I wanna see if we can, uh pause and maybe open it up for some questions. But before that, uh, I'm gonna turn the recording off. Do you have a, a contact slide you could put up? Yes, I do. Contact information? Yep. All right, yeah. So if anybody wants to get in touch with Joe, uh, either on the call now or watching, this is how you can do it. I'm gonna stop recording.